The purpose of this video is to explain some options that may shorten your waiting time for a liver transplant. We'll begin by explaining how priority for liver transplantation is determined. Across the United States, priority for liver transplantation is determined by how sick you are. Blood tests are used to predict your chance of dying while waiting for liver transplantation. We use these tests to calculate what is called the MELD score. Priority for liver transplantation depends on your MELD score. Because there are many sick patients waiting for liver transplantation in the Bay Area, only patients with very high MELD scores are getting transplants. Even patients who develop disabling problems such as weakness, fluid accumulation, confusion, and internal bleeding may have a MELD score that is too low for transplant. If your score isn't high enough, you will need to get sicker before you get a transplant. This means that you could wait a long time or that you could suddenly get too sick for transplantation. Getting sicker may not be a gradual decline and patients who have liver disease may suddenly get very sick. We care about our patients and want to make sure that you understand your choices about trying to get a liver transplant. First, you should know that the MELD score required to get a liver for transplantation varies a lot across the country. There are areas in the country where the MELD score to get a transplant is actually much lower than in the Bay Area. Therefore, you could go outside the Bay Area to a center that transplants patients with a lower MELD score. This picture shows the MELD scores at transplantation at UCSF versus national averages. The blue bars show the percent of patients who receive transplants at UCSF by different MELD score ranges. The red bars show patients who have received transplants in other areas of the United States. As you can see, patients in other areas of the country often receive transplants at lower MELD scores than the patients at UCSF or other transplant centers in the Bay Area. To find a center with a lower MELD score for transplantation, we suggest that you ask your insurance company about referral to other centers outside of the Bay Area. You can also look at information at the website www.unos.org. Another choice to consider is that someone can donate a piece of liver to you. This is called a living donor transplant. There are risks to both the donor and the recipient from this type of transplant, and not everyone is a candidate for this. If you would like to know more about living donor transplantation, please ask your hepatologist, your surgeon, or your transplant coordinator. Another option to consider is a transplant from a donor that is less than ideal. In the next few minutes, we will explain the differences between ideal livers and non-ideal livers, along with the risks of each type of liver. First, we will discuss with you the ideal liver. Usually, the ideal liver comes from a healthy young person who has died. 
Today in the United States, only about one-third of all livers transplanted come from these ideal donors. This means that it would be impossible for every patient to get what we would consider to be an ideal liver. It is important for you to understand that even ideal livers have the possibility of transmitting an infection or cancer because it is not possible to test donors for every infection or cancer. Sometimes tests may not find an infection or a cancer that is present, or we may not know that the donor used intravenous drugs or has had other behaviors that would make the organ not ideal. The risk of transmitting an infection or cancer from these donors is low, probably less than 1 in 100. This means that there is a small chance that you could get an infection or cancer even from the livers of a young person, despite our best efforts. There are other donors who can provide livers that are not considered to be ideal. Many of these livers will work fine and may not present any risk to you other than the small risk of transmitting an infection or cancer just like an ideal liver. Some of these livers have a higher risk of transmitting an infection. They may also have a higher risk of transmitting cancer. Some donors may have a liver that will not work as well as another liver. If you are willing to accept a higher risk that results from one of these non-ideal livers, you may be able to receive a transplant sooner. We may offer you a liver from a non-ideal donor if we believe that your risk of dying while waiting for a liver transplant is higher than the risk of receiving a non-ideal liver, and you agree to take part in this program. If you decide not to participate in this program, we will not offer you a liver that we consider to be non-ideal. But if you do participate in this program and you don't feel ready to take a higher risk at the time you get called, you can always decide to wait for another liver. When you are called for a transplant, the surgeon may discuss information about the donor that makes the liver non-ideal. We want you to understand this information before you receive this call. To review, these are the three types of donors that we consider to be non-ideal. The first of these non-ideal donors has a liver that may transmit infection more commonly than the ideal donor. The second type of non-ideal donor has a liver that may transmit cancer more commonly than the ideal donor. And the third type of non-ideal donor has a liver that may not work as well for three specific reasons which we will explain later in this video. We'll now talk about donors who have livers that may transmit infection more commonly than the ideal donor. The first type are donors who may have been infected with hepatitis B. Some people get exposed to hepatitis B during their lifetime and the body handles the infection but there are traces of the virus in the liver that can transmit hepatitis B. We have found that these livers work well, but you would need to take for the rest of your life a medication that would prevent you from developing hepatitis B. We have used these livers and our patients have had very little infection from these livers if they continue to take the medication. Some donors have been infected with hepatitis C. We do not use livers from these donors in patients unless you already have hepatitis C. 
We only use these livers in patients who are infected with a particular kind of hepatitis C called genotype 1. We only use livers that do not have scarring from the hepatitis C infection. For patients who have this type of hepatitis C infection, the result of transplant appears to be as good as if you received a liver from a donor without hepatitis C. There is another group of donors who have a higher risk of disease transmission. These are donors who have been in prison, who have used IV drugs, or who have had sex with a high-risk partner within one year of becoming an organ donor. These donors may have a higher risk of transmission of HIV, hepatitis C, or hepatitis B, despite our best testing for these viruses. This is because the patient may have recently become infected, and the test has not had enough time to turn positive. We do believe that the risk of transmission of viruses from these livers is quite low and for many patients the risk of getting these infections is probably below the risk of dying while waiting for transplantation. We do not use organs from donors who test positive for HIV. Sometimes we know that the donor may have a history of cancer. We only use organs from these donors when we believe that the risk of transmitting cancer is low. The risk of transmitting cancer can be estimated by the type of cancer and the stage. When you are called for an organ offer, the surgeon will discuss information with you about the donor and the risk of cancer. In the next part, I would like to talk to you about some different types of livers. These livers we do not think are at higher risk for transmitting infection or cancer, but may be at higher risk for not working well. We will discuss the three reasons why these livers may not work well. The first is the older donor. These older donors' livers appear to function less well over time, particularly in patients with hepatitis C. Older donor livers, however, appear to function essentially as well as younger donor livers in patients without hepatitis C. The second type would be a split liver or partial liver transplantation. Some livers from younger donors may be able to be split or divided into two pieces, one larger and one smaller. The larger piece usually goes to an adult while the smaller piece goes to a child. Sometimes, though, we are able to split the liver between two adults. Getting a piece of a liver rather than a whole liver may increase the risk of bleeding, problems with the bile duct, and also problems with the liver not working well. The third type of non-ideal livers are donated after cardiac death. Most organ donation occurs after brain death. This means that although the donor has been declared brain dead, all organs, including the heart, continue to work. Removing organs from these donors while the heart is still beating is called donation after brain death. Some donors do not develop brain death. These are donors where the brain has been severely injured, but the patient has not been considered to be brain dead. In this situation, the patient's family may decide to withdraw medical care and allow their loved one to die. These families may also want their loved one to be an organ donor. Removing organs from these donors after the heart stops according to the wishes of the family is called donation after cardiac death or DCD donors.
there appear to be increased risks of receiving a liver from a donor after cardiac death. These include the fact that after transplantation, the liver may not work well. This may require an emergency second transplant. There also appears to be a higher rate of bile duct problems. These problems may require you to have more procedures or cause your liver to not work well. The risk of transplant failure also appears to be 5 to 7 percent higher with a donor after cardiac death than with a donor after brain death. Now that we have explained the different types of liver organ donors, you can decide if you want to participate in this program. Please read the letter about these donors, and if you want to participate, sign a form consenting to be considered for these donors. If you do not want to participate, check the appropriate box. Deciding not to participate in this program will not affect your status on the waiting list. Even if you decide to participate, at the time we offer you a liver, you could decide not to take that liver. Doing so will not affect your status on the waiting list. We want you to understand all of the options and be able to determine if participating in this program is something that is best for you. Our team is available to help you make a decision that is right for you. The risks and benefits of this decision may change over time if your liver gets sicker. These issues will be discussed with you as your condition changes. Please talk to your hepatologist, your nurse coordinator, or your transplant surgeon about any questions you have regarding this program.